We are live. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Woo! We made it. We did it. The 14th Woo! countdown, successful countdown that we did with the music and the counting to our millions of fans out there on the planet Earth. I'm Adam with Hospiamo. We got my brother, Matt Zambruski with Agile Game Changers. And we welcome our person who moves the industry forward, entrepreneur and food safety culture builder, Josh Cook with Raise the Grade. So hello, everybody. Hey, how's it going? Glad to be here. Thank you. Um, we were, uh, I've known Josh and Raise the Grade for a couple years now. And uh, this uh, podcast that we're doing together, Matt, we said that we would do 10 just to be consistent and try to get better at something and try something new that we've never done before. And uh, we're now on number 14. So congratulations to us. Awesome. Congrats, gentlemen. It's awesome. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Going. We, um, it's nice back. not to have any, any, uh, you know, the goal is done. So we're not like going to, uh, change the goalpost. We're not going to say we're going to get to 25 now. We're just going to keep going. How's that? Let's keep going with, with great it. guests like Josh, you know, we got so much to cover and everything. I'm excited to dive in today. Yeah. I'm kind of like shot out of a cannon. Cause, uh, Josh, um, we were on the, the phone yesterday or on the doing a, a little test and Josh got me all pumped up about um, uh, the how I got originally certified in uh, food handling uh, and tips and alcohol training back in the restaurant uh, and hotel world. I was first uh, trained in 2000 or certified in 2002. Um, and uh, I should say first tip certified was like 1996 just because I wanted to be a bartender and make some money. Um, so we're going to talk about you, Josh. We're going to talk about Raise the Grade. We're going to talk about your history and uh, your story. I think that our audience is going to love uh, hearing about the critical importance of what you do. They're going to love learning about how easy it is to learn about what you teach and train people on. Uh, we're going to be talking about children even like when is the earliest age that somebody can learn about proper food handling and keeping their family safe. We're going to talk about how parents might find this very interesting. So I say our audience, um, who knows who our audience is because this goes on a continuous loop live on LinkedIn live, uh, live on YouTube, live on Facebook. Um, uh, hospiamo.com has a, uh, the, the feed for everything. So if everybody wants to, uh, jump in and see previous episodes, um, the, uh, we got John Cardonia, my man just said hello. So, um, hi John. hi, John, anyone listening, please, if you're, uh, you're, you're watching and listening live and you're on LinkedIn, you can like, you can comment, you can ask questions. We're going to be talking a lot of, uh, probably some new words, and new terms for people that you may not have heard before. So if anything clicks in your brain and you want to ask a question, please just pop in a question. Um, John Cardonia, uh, uh, honestly, he's my question man. He, he always comes up with really good questions. And so uh, when we're on the phone, it lasts for two or three hours, but I promise we won't last for two or three hours today. So uh, we did a quick hello, Josh, right? So um, yeah. this is your uh, website. We are going to take a quick look at this, but then we're going to go to a video clip um, that is a montage of multiple clips of you training um, and uh, live streaming the training on Raise the Grade. And so uh, I love your tagline, by the way, um, of Raise the Grade, creating food safety culture. And we're going to talk about your culture, your history, but I just love it because really uh, what everyone does, whether you're working in an office, whether you're in hospitality, a restaurant or hotel, it really is about the culture, the service culture that what you um, uh, are able to create in the day to day. And so I love that tagline, creating food safety culture, because uh, I've uh, been in, in this industry for a while and food safety is not talked about at the board level. It's not. Um it's on all the websites, of course, but it's not talked about as a major priority. Always thought it should be. Uh, it is very under budgeted. Okay. 
I'm a, um, a big advocate of funding budgets specifically for this region reason. And so to all you hoteliers and restaurateurs out there, it is August 24th. And we know what happens in September, particularly in the hotel industry. It's budgeting season. And anyone who's worked with me before, I hate that we call budgeting season because it lasts for months. There's so many back and forth when uh, this is a major piece that should be talked about at every single budget meeting. So to all you owners out there, if you're looking to spend any money, any extra money you have, and I know what they're all saying. What do you mean extra money? Well, fund training food safety, beverage safety, um, specifically for certifications for your workforce, for your emerging workforce, for your incumbent leaders, fund the budgets and all your team at the, uh, your, your property team members and leaders will execute it with the help of people like Josh. So I'm going to pop your website on here, Josh. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sorry, your, um, your web, um, domain oh domain contact information yeah i made a little overlay i taught myself there you go okay oh fancy thank you to streamyard.com not our sponsors today too. but they're welcome to be sponsors yeah. in the future um September's so we are National streaming food on food safety month throwing that out there Th this month is august september september all right let's i'm going to add that to the list we're going to talk about that all right, count all right so Seven, we're going to pop it on. Uh, we're going to pop this on multiple times during our conversation. But raisethegrade.com, and we have Josh Cook with us, J Cook at raisethegrade.com, uh, for his email address to contact him, and then creating food safety culture. So, I'm going to put on a video, and I, I just oh, yeah. you, you, you shared it, and I thought it was awesome. And um, we're going to watch the whole thing. And we're not going to do what Adam likes to do, which is pause it all the time. My wife will confirm that she does not like how I constantly pause videos. Say, what do you think about that? But um, we are going to watch the whole thing and then we're going to come back. And so you won't see our beautiful faces for about four minutes. So um, sorry, John Cardoni and our millions of listeners. You know, you're just going to have to uh, deal with missing us for a minute. So I'm going to pop that on and uh, we'll be back in a, a few minutes. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. And uh, so we will make today uh, as painless as possible. Uh, and uh, we'll learn some things too. The kitchen uh, as well. So we've got a full commercial kitchen right here. Uh, we call this one of our kitchen condos. Uh, we actually have 14 of these spread throughout our building. And so I'll tell you what, let's just take a quick walkthrough. I'll give you a quick tour on where we are going to be filming today. Let's roll. We're going to be filming at the City Kitchen today. Let me take you a tour. Come on in. First thing I always like to point out are all of these beautiful scores uh, from the health department with our different vendors here, right? And then you the top of the line. Cooking equipment here, too. Rationale. Uh, skillet. Gives you an idea of where we are. So we're going to start by uh, just uh, with a couple of simple questions. Uh, real quick. So you should see this pop up and you can just answer right on your phone, uh, just like we did previously. Uh, but how many people do you think get sick from foodborne illnesses each year in the United States? And when we say there we go, things are being passed to food. So now, you know, staying hydrated is important, right? So uh, working on the, uh, the pizza line at this Italian restaurant, well, you know, if, we were, if it was a long day, if it was Mother's Day, you know, I'd be standing in front of there for 12, 14 hours. So obviously I'm going to want something to drink. So we were allowed to keep drinks at our prep stations as long as the drinks really meet two requirements. And this is applicable to any food service operation. Uh, but again, you know, the company policy usually kind of dictates this too. But they allowed that because they wanted us to stay hydrated. So as long as the beverage was stored properly, it's got to be stored down below, right? Usually like on the bottom shelf, off the floor, and just, you know, not next to food, obviously, or food utensils, but also the container. So the container, the drink has to be in a container that is designed when the person takes a drink 
the fingers never get close to the mouth. As long as the container meets that requirement, it's perfectly approved. So it could be, you know, a styrofoam cup with a lid and a straw. It could be like a to-go coffee cup. Uh, it could be even like a container from home, right? As long as it meets that criteria. But, you know, my coffee cup here, it's got this flip top lid. So to open it, I have to touch right here. And this is where I drink out of. So tech, like something like this would not be approved. And that's the, uh, the thought process behind it too. Just keeping the fingers yeah, away from the mouth. People here share uh, a little bit about um, kind of their food businesses and anyway, share their story. So anyway, we'll let Sam take it. Sam Dimenich, I'm the chef owner of Your Farm's Your Table. I was born and raised in the family business. Okay. Yeah, my grandfather was a chef, my dad was a chef. So we have, basically we have four divisions. We have meal delivery. Um, so we do a three course dinner, uh, delivered to door Tuesday through Saturday for 40 bucks. All of that food is locally sourced, and uh, the, there's a new menu chef day. without being a cook first, right? So go learn how to cook. All surfaces in a food service operation must be what? really going across the board here. All right, and so and most of us went either durable or sanitized. And the key word being all surfaces in the food service operation must be durable, officially speaking. Now, but again, floors don't really touch food unless we're gonna use the five second rule, which I'm kidding, right? We should not do. Uh, now, speaking of cleaning and sanitizing, we're actually gonna go into the dishwashing area of the, uh, of the city kitchen here. And so we're gonna take you guys on a step-by-step -step walkthrough on just how to set up and how to properly use a three compartment sink. There and Real quick, what's your favorite thing about doing dishes? That cleans my hand at the end of the day after cooking all day long. <laughs> So we are back here again in the dishwashing area at the city kitchen, and then we've got a three compartment sink set up. So to demonstrate items about the area that need to be in place, and we're going to go through the actual process too. So kind of the first few things to keep in mind is when we are setting up the three compartment sink area, because we're going to have sanitized utensils, dishwares, Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks. All right. So that was uh that was awesome, Josh. Um I'm gonna figure out our visuals here real quick. Let me see if I can give you the highlight. Okay. Um th so I have uh some uh topics that you just discussed there on the video that I'm gonna ask you about. Mm -hmm. Um I'm gonna work backwards though. Um I'm gonna relate this a little bit to people at home. Okay, so uh uh, if they're at a hotel or a restaurant, they may have already been understanding some of these terms, but some of our uh, listeners are parents, but they don't work in hotels or restaurants. But we do know that almost everybody eats at a restaurant. Uh, almost everybody um, is, uh, especially now, but and maybe before, but the topic of sanitation, the topic of foodborne illnesses and things like that um, is just it's more uh, prevalent today than it ever was. And so um, the three compartment sink, okay, that you talked about at the very end, uh, everyone would love to have a three compartment sink at home, <laughs> but what is the purpose of that? And what is that? Why is there a, a standard to have three compartment sink at a, a restaurant in order to be standard? Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, at a minimum, uh, all commercial food service, or all commercial kitchens, right? And kind of starting with, yeah, they're very different from, you have a lot of different layouts with residential kitchens, but all commercial kitchens are required to have basic characteristics that they all share, right? And, and kind of by design, it's really easy to clean, but also things are set up to be anything that touches food. Uh, we call it a food contact surface officially, but it's required to be cleaned and sanitized. So at a bare minimum, Every commercial kitchen, and we're talking not just you know freestanding restaurants, but the vast majority, 99% of food trucks, food trailers, commercial food wrap, they're required to have a three compartment sink. And that's just because we're required to have you know, a step-by-step -step process to, and there's a standardized way to do it, 
uh, on to not only wash, rinse, but sanitize any item that that uh, that touches food. Got and it. Sanitization. So that's yeah. what it is. You you wash in the first one, and then you rinse it, and then you sanitize it. And Absolutely. so got it. Well, you know, at home it's kind of the same thing, right? So the um the you if somebody's washing their dish by hand, you you wash it, and then you have to rinse it because it's contaminated with soap if you don't. And then uh, when you put it over into the uh, to dry, um, it becomes, you know, technically it's sanit sanitized. But I can tell you that what most people probably do is they have a plate, they'll wash it, they'll rinse it, and then they'll grab their dirty old dish rag that is, you know, do the test on it. You'll probably find a couple more bacteria than you would want. And then you dry it and then you put it in there. Well, uh that's not how it works in restaurants and that's not how it should work in restaurants or else you're going to lose your license. Right. So, um, I always found that fascinating. Um, the, what I thought was really cool. So we started at the end, but we're going to go back to the beginning. So you said, welcome to the, you're in city kitsch. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you are in North Carolina. I'm in Charlotte. My brother's in, in Boston area, mm -hmm. Massachusetts. Um, we have listeners, you know, throughout the mid Atlantic Southeast, throughout the cool. United States, um, we have some in Hawaii, uh, even so, um, uh, the, you are in North Carolina and the city kitsch is in North Carolina. Is this where it you do your team? like, what is the relationship there? Yeah, what is absolutely. And so we, uh, we partnered with the city kitsch, um, uh, about two years ago, uh, as a matter of fact, and one, we just kind of had a lot of, um, similar goals. I uh, we could kind of help each other uh, to a large degree. And so uh, it was first started by uh, a lady that we call her Chef Carrie, but uh, she was a, an instructor at Johnson and Wales there in Charlotte and um, kind of a, an investor group uh, kind of approached her. She's still kind of uh, involved and, and co-owns part of it too, but they wanted to kind of expand her concept. So there's two in Charlotte and, and one in Greensboro. And what that is at the city kitchen, it's, uh, we call it, you know, uh, uh, Oh, what is it? Uh, communities cooking together. Uh, exactly what the tagline is. So we're right around the, those lines. But uh, yep. it's a ghost kitchen concept. Uh, it's also a commissary for food trucks. So we have a lot of independent businesses, owner operators. Instead of having to, you know, shell out, you know, the full, you know, uh, major expense of trying to build or, you know, go into a freestanding restaurant, uh, we have shared kitchen space. We have kitchen suites that are available. Um, and a whole platform for, for people to, to use as far as ordering and um, uh, customer. They can truly sell their food to the public. So. It's very cool. I mean, if uh, the, the example of how a ghost kitchen was um, explained to me uh, when I first learned about it was, uh, a, was a, a, a pizza uh, worker. Mm -hmm. uh, there, was, it, it, um, there was a popular pizza um, brand here in Charlotte. And there was a, a cook that worked for the owner for like 15 years or so. And he wanted to, he had an idea for a new kind of pizza. And so the owner of the pizza brand put down like a, a, a deposit at a ghost kitchen. And it's a, like you said, it's a, a small, you know, uh, encapsulated uh, kitchen essentially. And he uh, allowed that worker, this is beautiful, he allowed that worker to continue working at the restaurant, but also to uh, try out his new pizza recipe um, and sell it to the public. And they were able to almost like overnight order it on DoorDash, had his whole menu, and he's just back there cooking, you know, and cooking, cooking, cooking. And uh, and not even needing to worry about the whole delivery and the pickup because mm -hmm. places like City Kitchen that are a ghost kitchen, I think what it's done for food entrepreneurs is amazing, that entire concept. So, you know, cheers to you for partnering with them. And uh, it's very aligned with your mission, too, for, you know, um, uh, food safety culture, because mm -hmm. it's it's probably one of the cleanest places to be. <laughs> the, yeah, it is. Know, so yeah, how many kitchens are in there? Uh, how many and kitchens? every our, out of the three locations we have, uh, Greensboro, where I'm at, has the we have 14 kitchen condos or kitchen suites, kind of how we want to. And they're they're all laid out differently, kind of depending on the needs of the the person who who wants to go in. Uh, Very cool. So a lot of them have the what the uh, the whole ventilation hood systems, fryers, you know, ovens, of course. And there's 
They've got coolers, freezers. We have shared cooler uh, space too, or freezer space too, if anybody needs it as well. And so Very a lot cool. of caterers come in. Yeah, use a shared kitchen space. Yeah, it's I, it's it's fun to be around, and and especially with the energy that a lot of the food entrepreneurs bring with them too, right? Um, and it's that it's just you can kind of uh, everyone feeds off of it together, if you will. Josh, you know it. Um, and, and Matt, were you just going to? I was going to ask a, just a question. So, someone outside the industry, I, I was in the industry for a little while. I had my own uh, nutrition bar company, so I've uh, and I did work in a. Uh, well, I eventually found a commercial kitchen that helped out with a lot of what I was doing. So I know a little bit more than the average Joe out there. But for the people outside the industry, how does the business model of that work? You got 14 there at that location. Are you rented by the hour, by the day? And then, like you mentioned, I think you have like shared cooler space and freezer space. So is there like a central location? Do you do you charge like storage per month or whatever? Because a food entrepreneur needs to think about all that. Like, how am I going to do it? during the day, it takes me so many hours, maybe I only need so many hours a week or so many days a week, but then I have a lot of um, product to store, maybe mm-hmm. fridge, freezer or something before it ships out. Uh, so Adam spoke a little bit about the shipping model about with DoorDash and things like mm-hmm. that for like real time delivery, but explain a little bit about the business model. You know, we, yeah. we talk about entrepreneurship here, you know, how does it work? Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, there's different setups kind of based on the need of you know, what the person wants to do. Uh, and so kind of starting off the kitchen suites, we have these available for three year leases uh, and we can kind of outfit it however the person wants it. Uh, you know, and it's locked in for, for three years and uh, access to, to full everything. Uh, now, in addition to the kitchen suites, we have shared kitchen space. Uh, and I'll say we've, well, I'll say, I think eight different shared kitchen areas uh, that are all available by the hour. Uh, and so once they uh, come on board with us, uh, some some folks she does um, she's a lady she does African food, uh, and she just uses a shared kitchen space instead of she didn't really want a suite didn't really fit her needs, but she said I think she's open from what uh, I think noon to to like seven every day in the shared kitchen space and kind of sets up there and does her thing. Uh, it, people can run it by the hour, so the facility's open. That all all the members have access twenty four seven. So, you know, we have some type of bakers that come in at three o'clock in the morning uh, to, to do their thing, so on and so forth. And so it, it's really set up for how anybody needs a lot of our food trucks. Uh, of course, they use this to come in and clean and sanitize using the three compartment sink dish machines. They have access to, to all of that. Uh, so you're, pretty, uh, you're, you're pretty strategic in uh, being uh, partnering with them because they all need to be certified. So you, you not only have one restaurant to certify with all those, you have 14 of them. Right? That's right. So that's good, man. Uh, that now, so that's like the, uh, the you're in Greensboro and you're there, um, in person training. And we're going to go through a little bit of your, your history with how you first got started. But I wanted to ask you specifically one during that video we saw, but clips of that video was you speaking to a uh, what you call the live stream class, right? So I think that's really cool because when when you and I first met, um, also I'll give a shout out to uh, to Jake. Jake's uh, uh, Jake Young, who works with you, um, was who I initially spoke with. Really good guy, um, and he said that you were uh, in that process a couple years ago or so. You were trying to figure out a way to uh, expand and grow to scale and get more people. Uh, trained and certified. Now, you've already given me the number that you have, uh, um, what did I write down here? 43,000 individuals um, have, you've brought 43,000 individuals closer to their food safety goals and certification. So cheers to you, man. That is awesome. And so this live stream must be, give you availability to like explode that. Right. So um, the two things I wanted to ask you about what that looks like. So if somebody wanted to register for a live stream, I mean, I'm here right now on the website and they go here, uh, live stream class, they click on register, they, they click on all that and then they sign up for a particular time and then they um, they can do it for someone else that's in their family or a restaurant or a hotel. Um, and then it's you in city kitch live with all these different active uh kitchen condos and kitchen suites like you said i think that's the coolest thing 
And so I wanted to ask you about the, I guess the, the logistics of that. Mm -hmm. And then I want to ask you about that really cool, um, real time, uh, question that you had about the, uh, the, what is required uh, for food services on there on the video? It said, it does it have to be uh, sanitized? Does it have to be durable? Um, I picked sanitized and I was wrong. So uh, I was part of the other. Matt, you did too. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to maybe talk about the really, it, it's kind of innovative based on what I saw. I was like, that's really cool. I don't get to experience that a lot, even in real time classes. And so, was this difficult setting up live stream versus in person? Was that was that tough? Uh, it's uh, difficult, you know. It's um, I, I guess that's kind of a relative question, right? It's uh, in the beginning, everything seems difficult when it's new. Yeah. Um, but you know, when you look at it on the backside, you're like, well, that really wasn't too bad. Um, and so, and what it was, kind of the genesis uh, behind it too, is you know, with technology now, it makes it a little bit easier. But you know, there was we started with all doing in-person classes and just asking, you know, you guys in the audience a question too, right? The, do you learn better just doing an online module course or do you learn more actually, you know, when you're with the professor, like in the classroom and everybody answers, right? When you're with the person. And so we, you know, we tinkered with the idea of maybe doing like a module based course, but you know, I just, uh, maybe it's me the way I learned. I, just, I don't think that the, the idea was to bring, uh, the live person, you know, the live instructor to the couch, right? To the, the living room or wherever it might be. So you still get that personal touch. You can interact. And we just again, saw a lot of tremendous value and kind of that thing. you can just reach people better. You can touch people better. They can ask questions. And uh, how did you get that information? Did you just start doing it and ask them like, uh, who, who did you ask? Um, what do you like better in person or, or module learning or things like that? Yeah, I mean, we asked, I mean, j just un honestly, anybody. Um, yeah. I mean, and because it's it doesn't really matter who you ask, you kind of get the, we didn't take as long to, to find, we kind of get the same answers. Like, okay, there, there's a lot yeah. of value in the in the live instruction. And how can we, how can we, re how can we increase, you know, the reach of the audience or to, to reach those, uh, those people are on the West Coast, right? Or uh, basically, and you know, geographically, the in-person model is great, and and I still love doing it. I love being in front of the group and interacting with people. But uh, geographically, you're just very limited because it's you know kind of you have to have a body and a place. So, uh, and we wanted to make a product, the, the live stream there that was it was different. Uh, we wanted to be innovative, you know, and make it good. Uh, and yeah. you know, the whole idea, you know, so so people can still you know get get what they need to get certified too. You know, I'll. Uh... You're you're very good. Uh, you uh, it's it's fun to watch you on that video, right? And so I I put myself in the position of maybe being a trainee or or someone getting certified, right? And so you clearly uh, have a passion for this, and like the even the idea of saying, oh yeah, uh, we might be able to do a hundred thousand every five years if we just put it on a module, right? But then what you're saying is that the modules it might get them certified but the retention of that information probably is lessened over time. Right. So good for you for, you know, uh, staying true to your, your, your passion. And, and you would call this your baby, right? I mean, this is really cool. Raise the grade. Uh, and again, raise the grade.com. If somebody wants to go visit, let me just remind myself. There you go. Get out of the way, Adam and Matt. Raise the grade.com. We'll we're doing the website here too, everybody before too long, but um... you are. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, where did that passion come from, man? Like what, what how yeah. did you get started with, uh, with doing what you're doing? What's, uh, don't mind sharing there. Who first are you job and was... why are you on this planet? You know, that's one of my, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I was, I started at Domino's when I was 16. I didn't mean to start in food service, but, um, like most of us at 16, they just happened to be the first ones to call you back, <laughs> you know, and, so I started there scrubbing pizza pans uh, at 16 and full transparency. I, I think I got fired in like two weeks, uh, but a lot of us might have a similar story with that too. Uh, I did eventually mature. And so um, I, that was kind of the first taste of the industry, uh, I suppose. And my sister worked in restaurants kind of going through um, 
uh, high school, college, uh, and even after uh, as well. And then one thing I did enjoy kind of at that time, I think back is the, the camaraderie with uh, that you build as a team because you're, yeah. you're under a lot of stress a lot of times. And, you know, when you spend a lot of time under stress with the same group of people, you just kind of form a bond. Um, and I, I really like that culture. Uh, and so anyway, yeah, after school, took a sales job and enjoyed the, the sales aspect or what I really enjoyed. And I didn't realize it at the time was enjoy the presentation aspect of it um, and giving presentations uh, and, and being in front of people, interacting with people. And anyway, and just personality profile, that's kind of where, uh, what's it, it just kind of fit me, right? So got burned out with a sales job and uh, which that could happen to any of us to 80 hours a week. It's like, I don't want to do this forever. I yeah, you I, didn't make any bonds there, right? I mean, you weren't, uh, it was stressful, but still you're not interacting with a lot of people under that same stress, forging those relationships, right? True, so was, yeah. true. And, uh, and actually, I actually went to nursing school too. And obviously I didn't go that path. Um, and <laughs> the, uh, so, or maybe and, you did. Uh, like yeah. <laughs> bounced around a little bit. And anyway, I took some time off and I uh, got to give my sister credit. She was kind of the brainchild behind, uh, raise the grade and, uh, and the product and, uh, being in the industry and also with a passion for teaching. Um, we kind of formed what in 2008 raise the grade and just, um, uh, we said we can deliver, you know, food safety information, food safety training. We can deliver it a lot better, uh, and then the way it, uh, that it's being done right now. And so that was kind of the genesis of it, and where we landed today. And so, and the live stream is kind of the latest uh, product. And uh, of course, there's it's always evolving, you know, trying to get better and better, and uh, making the best it can be. But yeah, here we are. When you um when you were uh, when you started raise the grade, you said uh, you know, cheers to your uh, sister, um, it, what was that transition like? Were you working full time somewhere else, and then you started this slowly, or uh, what did that process yeah, look that, like? At that time, I was a corporate trainer with Macaroni Grill, which, uh, for anybody unfamiliar, that used to be a very popular Italian restaurant. Um, and yep. uh, but now it's great food, uh, I will say, and uh, I had a lot of again, kind of just a great culture there within that particular restaurant. Uh, and the, of course, the other restaurants I was kind of working into um, of, the, of that chain. And so anyway, yeah. And so we kind of started uh, raise the grade part time, just like a lot of things. It was a little side hustle. And yeah. uh, what uh, I think it was about two years in, um, you know, we kind of got it to the point where you, you have to make a decision. Right. And uh, as I say, like, you know, am I going to drink the Kool Aid or or not? And uh, so we we drank the Kool Aid and like let's just go all in and you know see what we can do here. Uh, and so yeah, it's been a lot it. of fun. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's a that that's a lesson that uh, my my brother and I learn also, and we talk about quite a bit. And it's like even what we're doing right now, we talked about for or we thought about for a very long time, and then in May, my brother Matt there said, "Let's just do it." Let's just start, decide on a time. And I was so nervous. Like my heart's going, like, what do you mean decide on a time? You mean go live on LinkedIn? Yeah, let's do it every, uh, uh, what are you doing on Thursdays? And I was like, oh boy, I'm going through that. And then Thursdays at three was born and we've done it 14 times now in a row. And um, if I kept doing what I tend to do, which is overthink things sometimes, right? And to not start something because it's not quite ready based on the whatever envision whatever i was envisioning um it's something that i think that we all learn uh and there's probably millions of people right now uh in the field uh you know specifically hospitality but any industry with a great idea you think that you can do something better like you like raise the grade like hmm how do we do this and now you're doing it live and i just love that evolution of uh of, of making things better um and you have quite an impact on you know thousands of people in teaching things like this so um now when i say teaching things like this okay so i'm gonna throw out a couple uh terms that i thought were awesome i've been uh, food safety uh food handling certified multiple times and it's one of my favorite things to do um uh family wise my my, my kids and my my wife you know we've not had any foodborne illness uh, in our family uh uh, in our house 
we had one little incident at a at a restaurant had some moldy frozen grapes which i think are been taken <laughs> off menus since then but um when we talk about foodborne illness um when somebody gets sick at a restaurant right so you're an expert at knowing what to do because part of this certification is what do you do when you get that phone call from a from somebody that recently dined at the restaurant saying hey we were there it was great but my kid is throwing up right now and i don't know what's going on i just want to let you know that there might be something going on with what we ate right so um from a, a public perception uh there is something that a parent can do right if they have something like that happen which i mean it happens right what is their responsibility to report it? And then after they report it to the restaurant manager or whoever, what's their responsibility? Mm -hmm. Can you help us understand that? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think as far as consumers go, right, it's, um, you know, we do kind of have that uh, what social responsibility, I think, to, you know, and in your mind, it, it very well may have been the restaurant, right? Now, statistically speaking, it's kind of up in the air, you know, overall. However, you just don't know. Uh, and so, you know, why not go ahead and make the phone call, you know, and it's, um, you know, it doesn't mean, you know, you're giving the restaurant trouble or anything like that. Um, it's just, it's important for, for them to know about. It. If by chance, right, there was some contaminated food that was, you know, still in the operation uh, or had been served, well, you know, at least it's kind of a starting point to kind of get the ball rolling to, you know, help help somebody's child, somebody else's child from getting sick. Um, it's just kind of creating that public awareness. And so I would certainly encourage folks like if you know, to yeah, call the restaurant, right? And, and I'm not going to say like a, every restaurant is going to be exact, exactly thrilled to get the phone call. Uh, but if, you know, if, if management is looking at it from the right perspective, uh, kind of going to the restaurant side now, you know, I would think that they would also want that phone call because they want to be aware of too, of what's going on in the operation. Do they, if there is something happening, well, they're gonna be, they're the boots on the ground. The first one that's gonna be able to you know, pull the food or figure out what's going on if there's an issue, right? And, uh, yeah. and a lot of times, uh, yeah, I think it's good to have a, an incident report form uh, to fill out. And a lot of times it is just that one phone call, right? In which case you're not really gonna take, you know, a lot of action. You might go check a couple of things just to be sure, but you know, if it's multiple phone calls, well then obviously that's you know, from a manager perspective, but okay, what's, yeah, we, we gotta, we gotta figure something out here and, uh, and kind of, yeah, it's a good point. Ready. Yeah. Versus no phone calls and it continuously happens and then something, uh, major happens. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, you had, uh, in that video, you had, uh, given the, uh, your students a example of the having a, a drink nearby and uh you showed the um uh the the tactile you know the reason why you can't just have a a cup of water sitting there um and you when you use it and so what the the term that came to me was cross contamination and so even the example that i said about cleaning a dish at home and using a towel that may have been sitting there with with other stuff on it to wipe it clean and then putting it in through uh, uh, and then to put ready to eat food on top of it. So if I was five years old or maybe 12 years old, how would you, uh, explain cross contamination? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. And so yeah, simply kind of the simplest way to put it, right. Um, is just a transfer of pathogens, whether it's virus, primarily bacteria from one food to or a food contact surface to another food or another food contact surface. And so okay. kind of in simplest terms, easiest way to think about it. So uh, that would be uh, like me using a, a knife at home to chop up some like raw meat, like some steak, mm -hmm. and then cooking the steak and then using the same knife to chop up some carrots that I'm just going to eat. Mm -hmm. Right? That's, That's right. A, okay. All right, cool. And, and you know, getting into the um, young children, it's uh, I have two daughters, one that's four, just turned four and then one that uh, is about nine months. Um, neither one of them are quite as nice. Uh, thank you. Uh, that you got many babies. You got raise the grade that's your baby and now you got an actual baby. And, <laughs> that's right. And a four year old. Uh, yeah. And it does change you uh, as a person too, in a good way. Uh, you know, for sure you think about things differently. And you know what, 
even though they're not at the age of, you know, kind of really being able to explain what cross contamination is and, uh, at that point, you know, when every child's different, uh, and those who are with older kids, you could probably speak to this better than myself because I'm learning every day, uh, you know, for my kids and kind of how to coach them as they're developing too. But is you know, yeah, I miss the better. memo that tells you what to do every day as a, as <laughs> right. a dad, right? <laughs> I wish somebody would write a book, right? <laughs> but you know, with our four year old was ingraining uh, hand washing and like getting making that the, the standard. And I, uh, we've worked with a lot of school systems uh, throughout the years too. And I had a teacher tell me one time that I think she was kind of a new teacher in the new school system that they, instead of the, instead of the kids actually washing their hands, the teachers just had them all form a line and they all went down and squirted hand sanitizer uh, on their hands versus instead of hand washing. Uh, and it's, that's really like, oh my gosh. Uh, and what a lot of people don't realize is hand sanitizers, they don't kill viruses, which is statistically the most likely to actually make you sick. They will reduce bacteria, uh, but specifically a pathogen called norovirus uh, does nothing to, to eliminate too. And it's really easy for kids because to, uh, to spread stuff like that around and hand washing yeah. is definitely by far the most effective, uh, the, the thing that we can do. The, the, the first trainer that I had, um, it was in New Haven, Connecticut, and I'll never forget. Um, it was when hand sanitizer became, uh, it's about 20 years ago, became really popular, right? And so uh, a person asked in the class said, uh, is hand sanitizer going to uh, replace uh, soap at restaurants? Like, can a cook just sanitize? And his answer was, but no, because it's not soap. And the person said, I don't understand. He goes, it's soap. And so he went on to about five minutes about the history of soap. He talked about the Vikings and stuff. It was, wow. he, he was very passionate about it and um, about how soap was meant and, and what soap, the process of not soap, it's the process of the warm water over however many degrees, you know, over a hundred degrees or so. And then the process of actually rubbing your hands and creating a lather and then rinsing all the bacteria goes down into the sink at that point. And then you wash your hands, hopefully with a not contaminated uh, dish rag, you're using a uh, uh, paper towel of some sort. And so um, th that was the, that was how he taught that. And so it really stayed with me because uh, hand sanitizer, of course, uh, is like the panacea for for all things <laughs> in the mind of the, the the regular consumer. But it's actually not because if you, well, I guess based on what you just said, you can you can rub your hands with hand sanitizer, and it'll kill the bacteria. But there's the norovirus and other viruses that don't. But also, I always think like maybe I have a little OCD. But if I have hand sanitizer, and I don't wash my hands, does it just stays there? Right. Whatever's on my hand, it just it's still there. So if I do this or that, I don't know. It, it just seems mm -hmm. like it's not the uh, as 100 percent clean as many people think. And there's been several studies on it, you know, and it's it, I when I'm doing a class, um, you know, one of the things I try to do to make it interesting is I try to share as much of the science behind it as possible. Right. And you don't have time to get too deep into it because you still have to get done within the time frame. But, you know, with um one of the interesting facts uh, is the natural oils and dirt on your skin automatically redu reduces how effective the hand sanitizer will work. So it will actually only reach this as a claim 99.9% .9 effectiveness if you wash your hands first. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that's in the fine and, print. Probably. Yeah, and you'll notice the fine print also. It's it's against federal labeling guidelines. It was the Food and Cosmetic Drug Act of. 1998 or 1993 or something is in there, but no company that makes hand sanitizer can make the claim on the product or packaging that they eliminate viruses. Ah, okay. All right. So we all learned, I think we all got educated in uh, around March of 2020 uh, or starting around then. So um, I think it's still uh, just to point out where we're having the, uh, listening to the two of you talk about this, you're both in the field, you're both in the know and you're, you're more in the uh, the very very small percentage of society that understands 
the mm -hmm. understands the depth of what you're talking about here, right? For the average consumer, mm -hmm. like you're saying, bro, that yeah, we, we learned this in, in the beginning of 2020. Mm -hmm. I would argue that consumers didn't learn it and they still don't know it. They still think, yeah. oh yeah, we, we sanitize surfaces. We got like wipes all over the place. We got like gels all over the place. And they think, I think they still think that that's the soap or that's the cleaner that's going to make the surface better, right? Versus the soap and water. Um, you know what I mean? So I think I, everything you're saying yeah. is very, very important. And I, and I think it's great that the people in the industry get the education, Josh. But what's sad is that the people outside of the industry, 99.9% .9 of all the other people out there uh, who, who won't go to one of your trainings because they're not in the field, um, they still don't know some of these basics, which are really important for life. And what, what you said a minute ago, bro, where, where your family hasn't had a foodborne illness, that's pretty amazing because our family's had a number. Um, I think uh, we all have different levels of the, our habits for sanitation, right? Like I've, anyway, I, most of us have already ever got it. But my point is what you talked about with paper towels, I think there's a lot of basic health habits like almost like uh, what I think would be really cool, Josh, if you guys don't have this, I think it'd be a, it's a good suggestion is, you know, raise the grade of your home, a little PDF, a little video with you, Josh, because you're good on video. Hey, this is what you can do at home. You're not getting certified, but that's cool. a family, right? Te teach them the basics. Just, hey, soap and water, just what you guys just said. I mean, you told me this years ago, bro, and, and I have never heard it from anybody else. Right. You know what I mean? If people aren't watching. Yeah, and it really should be. And, and you know, with Raise the Grade saying uh, creating a food safety culture, it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't say anything about uh, you need to be in the business or be a restaurant tour. You, you can have a food safety culture at home. It sounds like, Josh. Right. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. you know, that's a good like point. A, if somebody is interested and they're not in the industry, if they're if they just want to learn maybe the basics, is there something mm -hmm. that they can jump onto your, is there anything on the website that does uh, have we information? Do have. Where they can, yeah. And it'll be displayed more prominently when we have um, kind of update the website too, but um, there's a resources tab. There's also um, a blog um, that, um, that we do. And it's got you know, a lot of different pieces in it. And a lot of the blog is, or some of the blog items are actually geared towards more of the home. Um, and I think last summer, what um, the yeah, outdoor, Outdoor food safety um, at home for your people, like grilling, in case you know, around that time, the holidays and uh, July 4th and whatnot, everyone's grilling out and, and that kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, and a lot of these uh, logs, posters, they're not hard to read. I mean, it can be for you know, anybody that's kind of looking at it. Obviously, some of them are kind of for, you know, for the people in the industry. But I even, I think looking at these, you can still kind of get an idea of what, um, you know, proper best practices. Uh, twist. And, you know, you don't have to go to the degree uh, at home. And, and I tell everybody, right, you're, we all do things differently at home. I mean, if I'm cooking bacon in the morning and a piece of bacon hits my kitchen floor at home, there's a very good chance I'm going to use the five second rule, you know, I mean, <laughs> it, it, it is, you just brush it off, you know, and I put it on my wife's plate, but uh, <laughs> and it's, 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 the dog usually gets it first, but yeah, it's, yeah, at home, it is easier to kind of take, um, you know, a little more liberty. And honestly, it's it's okay to a degree. It doesn't have to be quite as, as stringent because it's yeah, it's at home. It's supposed to be comfortable. Um, and uh, however, I think having those basic uh, things uh, in the home, too, teaching your kids early, hand washing, and uh, just to try to ingrain that, I actually count with her, even though I don't want to sometimes, even though I've already washed my hands. I just make her as we wash our hands and I count with her, right? And we practice one to 10, you know, to the four year old. So it's kind of kills two birds with one step. Um, and, and I'll share real quick just like, the science behind it. Now, and these are the what health inspectors will check for um, when um, coming into the restaurant. The, the re whole reason with the scrubbing, I was kind of echoing, I thought about with uh, you mentioned Adam, it's the scrubbing. This is the most important part right here. Uh, and in this 10 to 15 second range, so using this as a standard, right, with the whole hand washing process being 20. Uh, and what they found, and this is cited about 21 different hand washing studies done throughout the world, you'll remove 
99.9%, you'll get a three log reduction of transient or foreign bacteria on the surface of the skin, and a 99% reduction of foreign viruses, viral particles that could be on the skin too. So, you know, it creates okay. a standard uh, as far as what we want. Uh, and that's something, you know, easily, a lot of those principles, of course, it should be done at the restaurant, but you can certainly apply it at home too. Yeah, you know, it's on the face though, is that what you're saying? You're saying most of it's on the on the palms? Uh, and, uh, and underneath the nails. So when you're kind of scrubbing, you kind of you get underneath the nails the best you can. Um, yeah. and just try to get everywhere on the surface of the skin um, uh, that uh, could be up to kind of just like that. Uh, and 10 to 15 seconds. I mean, you can go longer, uh, but 10 to 15 will, will get that, uh, hit those numbers for us. Accessories are also... Uh you know, even a, a wedding ring or a ring. I mean, kids at very young ages are starting to, you know, wear accessories, and th th that's a nice little bacteria trap underneath the uh, that. So that I, um, that people should be aware of. So th this is one of my. So by the way, I I went to your website and I um, was clicking through those PDFs, and uh, good for you for sharing that with the public. I mean, I clicked on it and I clicked on one of my favorite topics. Because I do like to cook, and uh, when I I do share this, even with uh, with our dad, Matt, I've I've shared these temperatures with dad before because he likes to, uh, yeah. or he used to anyway, cook out on the on the grill. Yeah, he's like, uh, how the heck am I supposed to know how much to you know cook a piece of chicken? And I said, well, you know, you go to Amazon, you buy a twelve dollar uh, food thermometer, and right on the back of it, it says this right here. Usually on the back, look for it. Um, so, uh, th this is something for the public. I think that they would love to so show and know. So Josh, what are we looking at here? I think that you, and, Matt, you can see that, right? The, yeah, I can see it. Yeah. And so if a, uh, there's a specific order that we place foods now, and obviously this is a commercial refrigerator. I mean, I will say residential refrigerators are designed not in this way a lot of times, although I think they should be, you know, I can't. I uh, don't know if I can impact that industry too much, but we do try to practice this at home the most that we can. Um, and just because having your food stored in a specific order according to its internal cook temp helps reduce the risk of cross contamination. And so, what so if I what if I did the opposite and I put raw poultry on the top and I had ready to eat vegetables on the bottom? What could potentially happen? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and what, what bacteria do you associate with raw chicken? Uh, salmonella. Perfect, right? And so, and so okay. I ask that question a lot, and most, that's the response most people get. They kind of, you know, put those together. Uh, well, salmonella in nature, it's, it's naturally found in the highest amounts by volume inside the intestinal tracts of birds. So as long as we eat birds, Salmonella, we have to assume is going to be there. Um, and so kind of from a temperature standpoint, kind of think of it the uh, simplest way that it's the hardest to kill. So if you had raw mm. chicken on the top, if any of it at any point in time, you know, dripped any juices, you know, got down to anything below or any shelving below too, you're just easily setting up that risk for cross contamination to occur. And I stored it in this way, right? You can see if something did drip, um, packaging got torn, I mean, who knows? Uh, it would drip down onto a food that would automatically have a higher uh, cook temperature as a base. So anybody listening, go take a look at your uh, the order that you have your home refrigerator and take a, uh, a screenshot of this and <laughs> go look at it. And uh, to so see, can, that's a- Download it from the website if you want it's to. It's probably a very quick fix. Um, so the, uh, the, the numbers here, um, that 165 does that mean the temp the internal temperature that it needs Correct. to be in order to mm -hmm. safely eat okay so uh, and uh, not to say i mean if um what they found um you know and this is kind of the science side of things a little bit too that enough of the salmonella that could be on the chicken has been uh eliminated for anybody on the anybody in the world can, could eat it safely at that point um Got it. You know, okay. not to say yeah you know there's you know some a little bit of variation in there too, but. And then uh, I, I do, uh, I'm going to get back to what you just put up with John's uh, comment there. Can you bring that back up, Matt? Yeah, using the inside of my thumb. So uh, in cooking a steak, this is a, uh, um, John's a foodie, you know, and uh, um, 
what does that mean? So I, I've heard that before about the bottom of your thumb as mm -hmm. a way to test if a steak is cooked. Um, and the um, and that's good. I, I love that guy with there too, right? Thanks, John. Uh, John too. Well, and hopefully, right, your your thumb, you've got clean hands because you just washed them, right? So uh, of course, you should be good, man. Uh, <laughs> but that being said, right, there's the um, what uh, I can't remember exactly what it was now. Whether you like your steak in a rare, medium, medium rare, medium kind of there, you can use your hand as kind of a a guideline. Uh, and I can't remember exactly which parts, right? But one part is like rare because it's kind of squishy. Uh, okay. You push on the steak while it's while it's cooking, and then you kind of all the way up to like me medium mid well that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, right. So with, John is uh, J John saying that he's old school and doesn't like to use food thermometers. So that's okay, John. You keep on doing. I'm trying to keep you alive here, brother. <laughs> um, so that's good. The um, uh, is to, to all my friends and uh, our millions of fans out there, I apologize to anyone named Tom for what I'm about to uh, to say, but are they still teaching Fat Tom? Mm -hmm. As a, a, yeah. They are? That was one of my He's favorite things to learn, and both of my kids know what Fat Tom is. Uh, and I keep reminding That's them awesome. of it. That's awesome. What is Fat Tom, and what does it have to do with uh, creating a food safety culture? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. And so... The, uh, and it's really kind of, you know, it's, we try not to, to get too deep into it within the classroom um, just because it could easily go over, go over heads and go in too deep. But FAT Tom is the acronym for the conditions, the six conditions that bacteria, which are naturally present, you know, on food that uh, they need to, to, grow, to grow, survive, to thrive, you know, whatever you uh, want to call it there. Uh, and so as an acronym, FAT Tom stands for food. Acidity, time, temperature, oxygen, and moisture. And, and kind of looking at that, the easiest thing for most of us to control is time and temperature. Um, because, you know, we don't really, you know, oxygen, we don't really, this cannot really out of our control with the food, right, per se. You know, unless you get into canning or, or something like that, right? Uh, but bacteria need a food source. So carbs and proteins, hence the food. Uh, the right acidity level, right? So uh, that's why there's never been an outbreak with orange juice or grapefruit juice, right? Because the citric acid in citrus products naturally prohibits, uh, or sorry, inhibits uh, bacterial growth and uh, reproduction. And time and temperature uh, is, that's why we all have refrigerators. Um, we've all controlled time as an aspect and I think these when we've done this our entire lives, we just may not have thought about it like this. So when you go to the grocery store in July or August and you put all the groceries in your hot car that's been baking in the parking lot, right? Do you then say to yourself after you turn the air conditioning on, you know, I really want to go see that new Barbie movie. Um, and you know, it's, but it's, it's always in the back of everybody's head to go home. And so if you think about it, you're not controlling temperature, controlling time you're limiting the amount uh, of time your food is sitting in the warm as soon as you go straight home is there a uh is there a a time period so if, for an example if i go buy milk at 40 degrees or 38 degrees from the grocery store and i put it in my warm car that's like 100 degrees and i bring it home and i put it into my 38 degree hopefully or whatever uh refrigerator is there a time that i should be aware of that i should be not wanting to go over like and, uh, that milk outside and that's, of that 40 degrees? And that's a good question, man. Um, and one that I think is relevant a lot to, to those of us at home as well, um, or, or just more kind of at home um, food safety too, is now, you know, most of the time we don't have to worry about that in the car, I would say, right? Because it's always in the back of our head to get home and put the groceries away, which that's kind of ingrained. We do it without thinking, you know, uh, overall. Uh, but I think a lot of times the issue is food th that gets cooked oftentimes is allowed to sit out or it isn't put away quickly enough or maybe it's kind of forgotten about kind of thing. Um, and that's mm. usually where the issues kind of arise. Um, and, and as a standard, uh, I would say it, a four hour time limit um, is uh, and then throw it away. Um, you know, if you're planning on reusing something, you know, don't let it sit out for more than an hour and a half, two hours max. Um, before you, you know, either put it back into the fridge or you know, whatever you're going to do with it uh, for, I guess, kind of storage or, you know, eating leftovers, whatever that might be. Got it. 
So uh, you're saying that we should only uh, drink orange juice from now on, and we should wash our hands with orange juice and vinegar from now on. No, I'm just kidding. Or beer, um, I guess, right? Yeah. You know, the, uh, th this is the good kind of fear that I think that people, when they become educated, they start asking questions like, oh, my God, did I leave that milk out too long? Uh, is that why I was uh, not? It's a good kind of, uh, I don't want to call it fear, but it's a good concern for people to have. Matt, you said that you have to go, at, or do you have to go? Do we have to say goodbye? Yep, I got to hop to another commitment. Josh, okay. thank you so much. This is great. I can't wait to see more of your material and continue to educate the planet to build the food safety culture that you're working on. Good Thanks, stuff. Man. Thanks, thank dude. You so much for being here. We'll, we'll talk soon. Thanks, bro. Love you. Thanks, bro. Love you. See you soon. See you. Uh, we can start to uh, finish up here, Josh. I think, um, is, uh, is there anything that we... Uh, Time we missed time. that you wanted to make sure that you um, that we uh, we touched on anything that you got. What's next for your business? Is there uh, any projects that you're working on that you think maybe the public wants to uh, click on, raise the grade and learn more about? Or what? Uh, well, and I think the new website coming up um, and it, we're a few months out uh, from kind of having that build, but we'll have uh, a few extra things on there, too. Uh, one thing uh, we are excited about um, and it's just kind of a. Well, it's taken some work to get there too. It's called acute developing Q streams. Uh, and uh, can you thinking, say, can you repeat that? Yeah, a Q stream, which technically just is like question stream, a stream of questions. Um, and so it was a, um, a company called Q stream that uh, has developed the technology and the platform um, that you can kind of uh, white label it, put your brand on it, and everything too. And it's even proprietary as far as your questions that you so. The idea cool. behind it is it's micro learning and it hits people. So you, I can only get to some people so much in one day, but to, you know, with food safety, uh, creating that culture, it's really kind of that um, sealing it in uh, and or kind of that long kind of micro learning. You want to create habits, right? And standards that everybody always remembers. It's always on top of mind. Um, and, you know, when I, when I say remember it, they truly learn it. So micro learning, what it does is after the class uh, and it's a product where people can sign up for it and we can do like an entire staff team or something like that, where uh, it, they get emailed two questions a week uh, and, and this goes on for uh, anywhere from four to six months. Um, and, and so it's just micro learning just a little bit at a time. Yeah. You don't have to open any browser. I mean, it is literally as easy as boom, answered. Uh, and and it is, yeah. It's got a whole long explanation behind it, too. Uh, and what's great is, you know, from the food safety side, it's uh, really resonates with people long term and it really creates that culture internally that you want um, uh, as the good habits and standards. And I was going to mention one other thing with that, too, and forgot what it was, but uh, we thought that was pretty cool. Uh, and that's great. Yeah. So that's going to be a part of your curriculum and, and mm -hmm. part of the, uh, the the training and certification. Yeah. So it, mm -hmm. you can also follow up. Right. So you. Somebody Absolutely. learns and gets certified and then they can get the more micro learning later mm -hmm. to keep it uh, front of mind. Absolutely. <clears throat> How long do these uh, food handling certifications, are they good for? What do they yeah. expire? Great question. They do. And the, so the, the majority uh, of our folks use what's called the serve safe manager or the, the serve safe manager exam. And that's just a standardized like food safety certification exam uh, that's accredited and it's five years. Uh, and they, they do put, you know, well, why isn't every 10 years or something like that? It's well, most of our, you know, rules and stuff that we follow from a food safety standpoint are based on the, the food code, which is science-based. So mm -hmm. our rules and things are based on the science where we figure new stuff out. Um, and so just for example, they lowered the, the water temperature for hand washing, uh, in the 2022 food code, which was released in this, uh, this past December. So, um, you know, because it. You don't have to have 100. Technically, we could use 85 and is, achieve that same kind of standard. So, you know, it is that's kind of why they want people to renew just that refresher um, yep. and and pick up on anything like that. That's cool, man. So the um, you know we we a lot of our uh, the people that we support at Hospiamo are the ones that we uh, that are already doing things so much more than what people imagine um that they're doing so uh we've had some people uh highlighted and celebrated on this uh podcast that have 
already created nonprofits that are doing they're on some sort of mission and they're doing it. Um, if somebody's in the, you know, uh, a little bit along in their career, right. It could be a year, it could be two, it could be 10 or 15. And they've got some sort of, uh, and they saw this and they saw that, wow, Josh had an idea and he did something and he started his own business. And if it's food related, one, I'm going to say that going, getting this certification, um, through raise the grade to give you a plug here, it is a no brainer. And I would even say that if you are thinking about being a parent <laughs> or, uh, uh, or even a good friend and a good husband or a wife, then get this certification because it's, it's, um, I found it very affordable. I, I found it very time efficient, Josh. And now you're saying that you can even do micro learning. That's even easier. Um, you're making lives better. I can tell you. And so, um, thank you and congratulations on starting a business and sustaining it but you're making the world a better place. And a, a lot of people say that they are, but you got 43,000 uh, uh, people, individuals that have gone through this. Uh, and so the ripple effect is gigantic. And that's really what we are trying to do with this weekly live event is to create a ripple effect of, um, of, of positive impact and for whatever you're doing. So you're doing something really cool. And I would uh, like to, I know that we're going to keep on talking and cause we're going to be, uh, working together. Um, but I would love to, uh, if you have another idea or, uh, uh, concept that you're working on, you're more than welcome to come back on our show anytime. And cool, yeah, we even do, you know, recorded, uh, you know, informational type interviews and we can post it live and whatever we can do to help you, you know, we're all in with you. You know, you jumped into the, uh, the deep end of the pool many years ago, but we're, we're in there with you, man. You're not alone. Yeah, cool. Absolutely. Well, let's put it together. Thanks so much for having me on. And I can't, I cannot believe, has it already been an hour? It, uh, it has, yeah. An, an hour or seven. It, it does go by fast. It does. And, you know, we, uh, we like to be raw and uh, not, not raw foods, um, but we, uh, <laughs> or uh, unless it's ready to eat, of course, you know, officially. Um, but no, we, uh, we, we went into this, uh, trying to keep it to an hour uh, or uh, even 30 minutes when we first got started. And one of them went an hour and 40 minutes long because we had like eight people. It was an amazing conversation. And we started to get complaints to say like, it went on too long. Like, well, movies are two hours long, you know, and, and that's like $14 to go to a movie. We're not charging anybody anything. So, uh, and it's also, uh, if, if somebody doesn't want to watch it for that long, that's fine. This is on a continuous loop. And so we are going to send you the link. We're going to uh, we're going to share it with all of our friends, all of our network, and they're going to have an easy link to watch this. Um, and it is an hour and what, eight minutes long. But we're also going to try. I'm I'm trying to learn myself on getting uh, better at making little clips like how you did. And so that we can send those little clips of you talking about what you're working on, on TikTok and whatever it might be. So um, creating a food service culture, uh, food safety culture and what you're doing, it's a learning culture. It's a, a continuous learning culture about what you're doing. So everyone involved here, we're all very much aligned with that. And so I think it's an awesome thing. Cool, man. It's, I enjoy what I do and I tell everybody, I hope that comes across and uh, yeah, please, anybody, please, if you have questions um, or if you think of one next week, please shoot me an email. That's one thing we always uh, we love questions. We love being able to help folks too. Um, so please reach hey, out. Look at that. So I learned bothers. how to do this. Jay Cook. Great job. Add an E at the end of Cook um, at raisethegrade.com. That's Josh Cook. And then at raisethegrade.com, creating food service culture. So this was awesome. And thank you for spending the time. Uh, and um, thanks for, for teaching me and teaching us and being just uh, doing what you do. So thank you. And uh, congratulations on all the growth. And you let us know how we can help you. But thank cool. you very much for spending this time with us, Josh. Talk soon. Thanks for having me. Take care, everybody. All right. See you later. Thank you. Amen. Hey,